be truly about. That was really what set off the Reformation. Was that the church should be looking at everything except what it should have been looking at. And I think that as we go through the history of the church, you find over and over again that that happens, and I certainly think that that is true in the church these days. Often we become stuck on about a certain idea or ideology, try to make, use Christianity to prove certain points of view. Really, do you know what the church is all about? It's about loving Jesus. It's about wanting to love Jesus. Jesus, and about wanting to know him better. The problem is, you know, there are ways in which we can want to learn more about Jesus. We can pray, we can read scripture. The problem is, quite often, we sit down, we pray, and we kind of, our minds get distracted, and they go all over the place. We sit down with scripture, and we get confused, or we get frustrated with it, or we get bored of it. How do we get past that? How do we get excited again about being with Jesus? Jesus, and it has to do with a basic spiritual attitude that we need to work on. If we want to sit down, we want to pray, we want to read scripture, we want to worship God, we want to do the things that grow in our lives, we need to understand that there is a spiritual battle, there is an enemy that wants to keep us from it, and our own sinful nature, the very being within us, wants to keep us from Jesus. We need to submit fully to him to even want to be with him. And to do this, we need to understand a little bit about the relationship with God. How do we relate to God? How do we see God? How do we understand him? This is my basic picture. Now, I've done this before over the years, and sometimes I go away on holidays and I come back, and you may not always realize it, but pictures on the PowerPoint are actually getting to see my holiday pictures because I've suddenly got a bunch of new pictures that kind of work. And so most of the pictures today are actually the backgrounds of being little scenes from my holiday. It doesn't matter a whole lot. This is an interesting one. This was, um, we, we, of course, we went up north and we were predominantly in the Yukon, but we ducked down into uh, southern, southeast Alaska for a few days. And a little town there that we stayed in, very small town, much, much smaller Viking. About a dozen people live there now. Uh, a town called um, Dae. I'm not pronouncing that right, am I? It's always shaking her head. No, it doesn't matter. Dae. 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 That's it. Um, anyways, little tiny town. It was uh, back, founded back in the early 1890s. Uh, at its the early 1890s, got up to a couple of hundred people. Then all of a sudden, a little further up the road, they discover gold. Set off the Klondike Gold Rush. Everybody was heading up towards the northern part of the Yukon. This was a natural place to get off the ship, and then you can hike up what they call the Chilliput Trail, trying to get up towards the Klondike and all the gold that was up there. And uh, the, the regulations at the time were you had to bring one ton of supplies with you. And to get there, you had to go up this huge mountain pass, climbing up with ropes and all. You can't bring one ton of stuff. So you had to go up with your stuff, climb back down, go up with your stuff, climb back down, and back and forth. For about a year, this town was the center of this trying to get up this Chilliput Trail towards the Klondike Gold Rush. All of a sudden, this town that at the point of time was a couple hundred people suddenly grew to tens of thousands. There were 46 hotels in this town, dozens and dozens of saloons. That became very popular. All sorts of girls. All of a sudden, there were something like 20,000 permanent residents and at any one point in time, 30,000 other people there. Well, that's Main Street today. It doesn't quite look like a town like that, does it? See, after the, they went through a season where everybody was rushing up to the Klondike, number one, a lot of them got up there and discovered that there wasn't as much gold as they thought. 
But the other thing that happened is, as the last of them at, in April were going up over this pass, a landslide came down, avalanche, and dozens were killed, and they kind of stopped the excitement of going over that way, and they eventually built a railway that was just down the road to another town, and that town ended up prospering. This one died. But for a period of time, for a period of time, the passion for the gold brought this town life. Now, it was the wrong passion to have. But it is remarkable how passion does bring life. Now, if we are passionate about the things of God, if we believe that God is the God of love, that God's God of the, we should be passionate about the things of God. We should be excited about that. We should be passionate about knowing God. That should be our heart cry. And yet, even within the church, it is often not. It is often not. So we need to reframe this relationship. I want to read some scripture to you. I'm not going to put it up on the screen today. I'm not going to have you turn it. I just want you to listen to it. First one is, is what I've already read a few minutes ago. But now, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Righteousness of God is being right. Want to be right? Does God want you to be right in a, a right or wrong type of way of looking at the world? But now the righteousness of God is being made manifest apart than the law. In other words, manifest, it's become evident. And it doesn't have to do with the law. It doesn't have to do with being good or bad. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. In other words, being right with God is not about doing good. It's about who we believe in. It's about faith. For there is no distinction. Distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward and I'm going to use a big word. This is a different translation I've read out of earlier, and I'm doing this quite intentionally. I'm going to use a big word. You may look at me funny saying, what on earth does this word mean? Uh, we'll go, we're going to go through it a couple times through this one. Okay? So the big word is, God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance or patience, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at this time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We have this idea. Here's what Christianity is about. We can get forgiven for the most part as long as we're not too bad. Every once in a while we might hear a story of somebody who has some really dramatic conversion story and, well, they really found forgiven, but for the most part it's about those of us who are so bad, at least in our own mind. And then when we come to Christ, we find forgiveness for the little things we might have done wrong, then we start to act like a Christian all the time and we're well, pretty good and we're perfect. But that kind of has become the idea. And where it can be very hard on those who mess up. You know what? Righteousness is about knowing and loving Jesus. That, that, that's it. That's right and wrong. It's all about if we love Jesus or not. That is the definition in the Bible. God wants to love you, and He wants you to love Him. And being right is only possible by knowing Jesus, not by our behavior at all. God is not impressed with our actions. And I'm going to tell you, he loves us differently, desperately. See, it's because we have this wrong idea of that big word that I use, propitiation. Just made sure we caught this word, and I'm going to explain a little bit deeper 
at the end of the sermon. But basically the idea is to appease God. Mostly the idea of to appease God's anger, his wrath, his justice. It was a very key word in Greek history. See, the Bible is written, of course, to a different culture, a different time. It was written during the Roman Empire when Greek culture was understood by everybody. And there was one author everybody knew. In fact, everybody had to memorize his works. His name was Homer. You may have heard of him. What about the Trojan Wars? He wrote two books. Now, about the Trojan Wars, every kid had to memorize the complete books. If you've ever looked at them, they're really long. It's quite remarkable. They had to memorize them. You may know the story, the basics. Eventually, the Greeks sneak in as wooden horse full of soldiers, and they were to take the Trojans, who they're at war around because the Trojans had kidnapped one of the princesses from one of the Greek city-states. And it led to this great war. And for the most part, the, the works of Homer are considered legendary. They're, 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 while there really was a Trojan war, you know, the stories aren't quite accurate. But in the stories, at the very beginning, the leader of the Greeks, a man named Agamemnon, he sets off with his armies, they go across the water, they're sailing towards the city of Troy, and the winds blow against them. And the winds blew against them so hard that they couldn't even row to try to get there. And right away, they knew that there was only one way that they would get there, it's because if the winds were blowing the wrong way, obviously the gods were not pleased with them. So what do you do? Well, you've got to bribe them, right? And you've got to come up with a big bribe if you're going to do something real big. So they decided they were going to bribe the gods, and Agamemnon put the call back and sent the ship back and said, bring me my daughter. So they did. According to the stories, the way they bribed the gods was he sacrificed his daughter. Because if you're going to do something real big, you better give the gods something real big. A gift to God to make him. Do you know what? We let that fall into our thinking. Because that is not biblical. I mean, even the, I mean, the human sacrifice, of course. But you know what? We run into this idea that, you know what? If I, if I do enough for God, if I'm a good enough person, that's what God wants. That's what God's after. And then, you know, he's going to give me a good life. He's going to make me happy. If I do a grand gesture, that is the propitiation that God is after. If I do something big, I will make God happy. How do we make God happy? And I'm going to tell you right according to this verses that I just read, you do not. There is nothing that you or I can do to make God happy. You and I fail. You, have, you and I have nothing to offer God that completes him. You, have, you and I have nothing to offer God that he's lacking. He doesn't need us to worship him and to... Uh, to sing songs for, for his sake that, you know, we're kind of buttering him up. He, <clears throat> he doesn't need our behavior. He doesn't need our service. He doesn't need our rituals. He doesn't need our words. But it's not helpless. Because God himself fixes the problem. Our relationship with God is not based in any way on what I offer God. It's just because he loves me. The only part of our relationship that I have any part of to offer back is just to accept it. He give, brings everything and he's not looking for anything from me. There's a similar verse in Isaiah 66 verse 3. I'm going to look at the two verses before that, next week, 66 verses 1 and 2, they're all about uh, the grandeur of God. This one is kind of funny. He who slaughters an ox, in other words, they thought that they gave sacrifices to God, that that would make him happy, is like one who kills a man. In other words, that's probably the worst thing we can do, right? 
He sacrifices a lamb, again, something they thought they should give to God, is one like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways and their soul demons delights in their abomination. These are things that people thought God might want. If I give this to God, God will be happy. And God says, no, I'm not after this from you. And the people are arguing, do you know what? We bring these things to God. Therefore, he owes me. Therefore, God owes me something. He owes me because I gave it to him. I might mess up occasionally, and then I do something good, and I bribe God, now he owes me. We think that Christianity is about obligations. What is it I can do? And the answer is nothing. God completely controls this relationship. God doesn't need us, but he desperately wants us. He wants you to know it. One more verse. 1 John 4, verse 8 to 10. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, and here's our word again, the propitiation for our sins. Jesus came that we might know God and that we might know love. The word propitiation there has been lost in a lot of our translations because it's either misunderstood or perhaps, this is really sad, that it's offensive to some people. Because it means that I don't have anything, if I don't have anything to offer God, that, and, and I'm a sinner, and all those things, that, that, that doesn't really make my self-esteem feel real good. So we try to push that idea away, and certainly many have, have tried to push that concept away. It is to satisfy God's wrath. And the church has often tried really hard to prove our worth. Even go back to the time, you know what set off the Protestant Reformation? We're going to talk about this in a little bit. You know what set it really off was the fact that the church was raising huge sums of money through very dishonest means, actually, to try to build huge cathedrals. In fact, a whole bunch of them, but particularly one in the center of Rome, that would prove this is how great we are. We can offer God grand, magnificent buildings through our ingenuity, through our smarts, through our power, our strength, our wealth. We can prove, God, look how good we are. Or we try to prove it, maybe in our day and age. Look how good I am. Look how behaved I am. Look how much I sacrifice. Look how much I give up. All sorts of ways to prove that I am good. And we tend to think that we are. Because we're probably better than somebody else. I read recently somebody wrote that um, we tend to judge others by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Judge our, others by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. I think there's a lot of truth to that. That that person messed up, therefore they're no good. But, yeah, I messed up, but I meant. I didn't really mean it, you know. So we tend to judge ourselves in a different light than we judge other people. So we see ourselves as pretty good. And God doesn't say that God is perfect and our imperfections keep us from him. There's been a lot lately about, in the news, of course, about you know, tearing down historical monuments and changing names and different things, 
and things like that because this person did something that's offensive in today's concepts. It's a complicated thing, isn't it? Do you know what the bottom line with anybody in history? Anybody at all? Usually their intentions are pretty good, but they did things that are wrong. Do you know what? That's, that's kind of my story, too. According to the Bible, it's kind of all of our stories that none of us stands good. We all have wrong in our lives. It's not always based on our actions. It's the last passage about God's love. Do you know what? Rather than focusing on the world's imperfections and our own imperfections, we need to live with the kind of understanding that I live in the love of Jesus. To focus there, to bask in his acceptance, to thrive in forgiveness, rather than just looking and seeing my shortcomings and the world's shortcomings and being focused there, know his love, keep our focus there. Rather than having an attitude of how good I am, and being offended by others who aren't quite as good as I am, just know that I'm a failure who's loved, who's accepted. And when I do fail, this is really critical. Rather than fleeing from the love of God and feeling like, well, I'm not good enough, and staying away from God for a little while, running the other way, running right to him. So I see that over and over again where somebody does something that they think is wrong or has offended God or something, stop going to church for a while, stop praying, stop doing anything. It's not what God wants. God wants us to run to Him. We all fail. It's not that it's okay, but I have the cross, and that's what matters. And so we come to the cross. And we understand completely that I am fully and totally and absolutely reliant on Jesus. I need him for everything. So having said that, we're going to come to the cross. And um, invite the elders who are here to join me at the front. And we're going to, do, uh, we're going to come to communion. Um, remember cross and prayerfully quiet as, as the bread is being passed around just prayerfully focus on Jesus and thank him for his love and ask him to bring his love fully in our lives so I'll invite our others who are here